we made on Zoom. So we are living in. Okay, we live in a very exciting time. Uh, I think I was muted. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Yes, we so, can hear you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, right now is uh, a New Year's holidays in Korea and China and diaspora Koreans and diaspora Chinese. It's New Year according to our uh, lunar calendar. Uh, actually, yesterday was the new uh, New Year day, and today is just still we are in the holidays. And I, yeah, and we were expecting some cold weather, but it's a lot better than we anticipated. So it's a good thing. Well, as I was introduced, my name is Han Sung Kim, and I teach at X. Uh, it's an acronym of uh, Asian Center for Theological Studies and Mission. Uh, somebody cannot hear me, I think. So anyway, I think uh, Pastor Jeff will help with this uh, technical problem and I will just continue. Okay. Today, I'd like to sh uh, share the historical perspective of missions. To do so, I'm going to share the screen first. Okay. Uh, all right. So the title of my presentation is this. What happened when God calls a small, poor, and weak church? So what has happened? This happened is a historical fact. So I'm going to discuss three stories that has happened in Christian history or in mission history, okay? So what happened? So keep that in your mind. What happened when God calls a small, poor and weak church, okay? Have this question in mind and follow me. Well, in our understanding of history, I think we are suffering from severe nearsightedness, okay? Uh, nearsightedness is this. We can only see something clear that is very close to our eyes. When we try to see something that is uh, distant, then it becomes blur. So we only focus on something that is close to our eyes. That's nearsightedness in our medical term. I think the Christian church is suffering from severe nearsightedness because we, when we look at the mission history, the cross-cultural missions, we only see what is happening today. And we make judgments based on what we see today. But that's not right. Something happened in the past, and that is the cause of the effect that is happening today. So I like us to correct our severe nearsightedness in our historical perspective. Okay, well, let me confess my own shortcomings as well. I had a very severe nearsightedness in understanding of mission history. 
okay? And I think somehow I still suffer from it, okay? So we all have problems with our short sight or nearsightedness in historical knowledge. All right. So we need to, uh, like a photo one suggests, we need to correct our eyesight, our vision. Uh, photo two is our present condition and we need to adjust our vision so that we can see clearly what is near and what is far, okay? Hopefully, uh, with a 60 minute of presentation, we may see things clearly what has happened in history. Okay, the first story happened 230 years ago. Okay, I'm going to share three stories, three historical stories or three historical event or events. The first one is something that happened 230 years ago. What comes to your mind when you hear Baptist Missionary Society? BMS in short acronym. What comes to your mind when you hear Baptist Missionary Society? Oh, it's a mission society of a big strong church. Or oh, would you say, oh yes, BMS is a mission society from a wealthy society. Oh, come on, BMS is a mission society from a country that uh, whose sun never goes down. Oh, BMS has sent so many missionaries to so many different countries. BMS, well, that's a big mission organization by a big church in a very wealthy country. Is it really? Is it really the story? Well, I don't think so. Let's find out what it was in 230 years ago, okay? Well, let's adjust our vision, okay? We are now going back to what has happened before 230 years ago, so that we will understand the beginning of BMS, okay? Well, the reality of the society in England, 230 years and more ago. Well, the England or English society was still agricultural and small industry society. What steam engine was invented in 1776, okay? The Industrial Revolution happened after 1776. Well, Watts made steam engine and it was not good enough. So they need to improve steam engine and then they adjusted steam engine into different industries, okay? So industrial revolution started in 1776, but when it widespread, it took some more years. So 230 years ago, England, was an agricultural and small industry society. Well, the UK or England was the empire on which the sun never sets. Well, we heard this expression a lot of times, but this is true after 1858, okay? 
England was going abroad. England were English ships were going different places, but they were not the rulers at the time. It, by the end of 18th century. Okay. And in England, the Anglican Church, the church that you belong to, is the church in England. Not all churches were equally treated at the time, and I will tell you what it means. Well, the reality of particular Baptist church in the 17th century and 18th century was, was persecuted church, small church, and poor church. Well, I'm sorry to say this to Anglican ministers, but it's a historical fact that happened in England, so I'm going to say it. In England, in the 17th, 18th century, the Anglican Church of England was the church of the state. And all other Christian faith besides the Anglican Church was persecuted by the government mm -hmm. and by the church. For so example, 1661, there was an act was uh, established, it's called the Corporation Act. And they said, every uh, government employee, a public servant has to go to English, uh, Anglican church. In 1673, there was another law that was inaugurated. It's called the Test Act. If you want to be a member of the parliament, if you want to be uh, a public servant, you have to attend and take the Holy Communion at least once every year. Basically, if you are not an Anglican church member, you are not going to function as uh, a, a good uh, member of society. And it ends in 1689 by the Toleration Act. But even after, so that's the story of the 17th century, but in the 18th century, still there was persecution against the Baptist, okay? And particular Baptist church, which was the denomination of Baptist Missionary Society was a small church. In 1792, there was only 220 local churches. Can you believe it? In 1792, 230 years ago, there were only 220 local churches. And many churches were under 15 members. There were some churches that had hundreds of members but many churches were under 50 members. And all together, there was about 17,000 particular Baptist Christians in England. With that number, they started foreign mission. With that number, they sent missionaries to India, the famous missionary, William Carey. Well, particular Baptist church was not only small, but also it was a poor church. Most of their church members were farmers or craftsmen, just like William Carey. 
what was William Carey's job before he went to India? He was a, a shoemaker. Remember, he was a shoemaker ma maker, and it was not good enough to bring money home. So he taught at an elementary school. So he had two different jobs to support his family. It was not, the, the William Carey was uh, not an exception. He was more of a, a general representation of the members of the church. And particular Baptist churches were located mostly in small towns and farming areas. Why? Because most of their members were farmers and craftsmen. And because of that, they were so poor, they were not able to support their own pastors. So a lot of particular Baptist church pastors were bivocational pastors. William Carey was a bivocational pastor. He even said at one point that his church could not even afford the money for the suit that he can wear to church. Can you believe it? A church cannot support there he's pastor. So the pastor has to find a way to support his own family. So that was the reality of particular Baptist church. This church started Baptist Missionary Society, BMS, 230 years ago. All right, and how about the theology, oh, sorry. How about the theology of particular Baptist church? Well, the theology of particular Baptist church in the 18th century was very anti-evangelism, anti-missions. What they said, God knows, and God saves. So there is nothing for Christians to do. That's what they said. Uh, the 18th century, in the 18th century, particular Baptist church had a theology called hyper-Calvinism. In two regards, it was very hyper. They said and they believed it was wrong to share faith when God had already chosen. They believe, well, God chosen already. Then how if we share the gospel with the ones that God did not choose, it's a waste of time. Why do you want to waste of your time? That's what they believed. Can you believe, can you get it? They believe God chose whom to save and whom not to save. So God will take care of it. When God already chose whom to save and we human beings do not know it and share the faith with other people, but sometimes we are sharing Christian faith with the ones that God did not choose. That's a waste of time. That's a part of their hyper-Calvinism. Also, there's another wrong teaching. Somehow they believed only a certain number of people would be saved. And there is no room for more people. They believe only a certain number of people. It's, like, uh, it's not 144,000 people, okay? It wasn't 144,000 people. But somehow, they figured, they, they believe that God set the number already. 
And when God save those people, then there is no more people to be saved. Okay? Those are two core teachings of hyper-Calvinism. So it's very anti-evangelism. It's very anti-missions. But things began to change in 1780s. And for that reason, there was a humble beginning. BMS, missionary, uh, BMS Baptist Missionary Society was founded in 1792, 230 years ago. Okay? BMS was founded in 1792 by a group of Baptist mission ministers, Baptist pastors, under the leadership of Andrew Fuller with a vision of William Carey. And they sent William Carey to India in 1793. That was the beginning of modern Christian, uh, modern Protestant missions. But after that, Baptist church has gone so well. The Baptist church grew so well in the United States. So Baptist is the largest denomination in the United States. And because of that, we think Baptist church was large from the beginning. No, that's misconception. Baptist, Baptist church was founded in England it was a very small persecuted denomination for 150 years with a wrong theology. But when a group of Baptist ministers got together with a renewed vision of mission, they were able to send missionaries to India. Isn't it interesting? Okay, let me go back to this. Right before when BMS sent William Carey to India, the particular Baptist church, that is the church of the, the BMS, it was a persecuted church. It was a small church and it was a poor church, okay? So do not get confused with American Baptist Church. Well, American Baptist Church sent tens of thousands of missionaries to many different countries. American Baptist Church has done so many mission works, okay? but. The modern Protestant mission began by BMS that was a work of small, persecuted, and poor church. Okay, here's another story. 130 years ago, okay, 130 years ago, there was another church that began is mission work, okay? The Presbyterian Church of Korea. Okay, I believe some of you might have some acquaintance from Korea. The Korean church altogether has sent 22,000 210 missionaries to 167 countries in 2022. Wow, that's a big work, right? And Korean church is a strong and wealthy church, right? We have the biggest churches in the world in Korea. <laughs> the Full Gospel Church is the biggest. 
or the Saranya Church is the biggest. We have some big and and Gwangnim Church is the biggest Methodist and things like that. And well, Korea is a OECD member nation. Korean, the, the South Korea has gone through economic miracle in the seven, uh, 1970s and 1980s, right? And today, well, do you uh, ha ha hum some Korean pop songs or have you seen some Korean dramas or movies? I mean, there are a lot of Korean dramas and Korean pop songs in many different parts of the world. So maybe the Korean church was like that. And maybe Korea was like that from the beginning of history. We might think like that, but no, that is today's story. How about 130 years ago? Can you imagine how Korea looked like 130 years ago? Can you imagine how Korean church looked like in 130 years ago? Well, let's look at it. Okay, now we are going to adjust and correct our severe nearsightedness. All right. The first Presbyterian missionary to Korea was Horace Grant Underwood. He arrived in Incheon, South Korea, 1885. Okay. And in 1911, which is a little longer than 130 years, like a 131 years ago, there were only 140,470 members in the Presbyterian Church in Korea. Only 100. 40,000 Christians, uh, Presbyterians in Korea. And the, the Presbyterian Church of Korea had its first General Assembly in 1912. Until 1911, it was a synod, an independent synod. But in 1912, they organized seven synods and assemble and, and made a, a grand uh, a denomination. And they met, the, they met at the first general assembly. In 1912, there were only 52 Korean pastors and there were more missionaries in 1912. It was a young, and small church. I do not know how many pastors are in your diocese, how many members are in your diocese, but it's not smaller than 140,000 members. I believe you have a lot more pastors than 52 Korean pastors in 1912. Korea at the time was a poor and colonized nation. Korea was an agricultural society and it was, we used a man labored farming. We, we have a rice field. So it requires intense uh, labor. And the Korea, the Joseon dynasty, had a national isolation policy until 1875. So the, the country was very vulnerable to drastic changes in international politics. That's why we lost our sovereignty to Japan. The Japanese rule began in 1910. 
and Koreans became the second class citizens to the Japanese. And Japan exploited Korean resources. Okay? And for that reason, many Koreans left the country for better life. A lot of them left for children's education, and many of them left better opportunities. And also some people left the country to fight against Japan. It was a poor and colonized nation. And yet the Korean, the Presbyterian Church of Korea began a humble uh, attempt in cross-cultural mission. The Presbyterian Church of Korea which had only 140,000 members, sent three missionary families to uh, Shantung, China. Well, those missionary families were suffered and returned in three years. They were so suffered. One missionary died shortly and two other missionaries didn't want to go back. But the denomination uh, investigated the problems of their project and they improved the support structure and eventually they sent more missionaries. And altogether, they have sent more than 12 missionaries to Santung, China. And the last missionary came back to Korea in 1957, because China was uh, uh, under the communist rule, because the China, because China became a communist country, South Koreans could not stay there. So, for 44 years, Korean Presbyterian Church sent more than 12 missionaries altogether. Okay, and before this mission work, there were missions to Koreans diaspora, Koreans abroad before 1913. Koreans were in Manchuria, Russia, Japan, and Hawaii, and Korean church and missionaries sent evangelists to Koreans living abroad. After 100 years, from 1913, which is uh, now, it's been 110 years, uh, the church grew and the Korean economy grew. For those reasons, the Korean church sent 22,000 missionaries to 167 countries. Okay, and there's another story. Yeah, that's the third story. It just started a couple of decades ago. Okay. The Mongolian church. What about them? Do you know anything about Mongolia? Well, do they send uh, cross-cultural missionaries too? Did you even know that? Is Mongolian church big? Maybe they are rich. What is your idea? Well, you, I think, I assume many of you have no idea about the Mongolian church. Well, let's find out. Okay? So, Right now, we don't really know much about Mongolia and Mongolian church. So now we are going to learn what has happened in Mongolia and in the Mongolian church. And by the way, if you have questions, just type your question right now instead of waiting until the end, okay? Just type your question in the chatting box 
so that after my presentation, we can just uh, start a discussion, okay? All right. Mongolia. Mongolia is a developing country, beautiful country, cold, very cold, but it's a beautiful country. It's a developing country. In 2001, uh, per capita GMP, GDP was 513 US dollars in 2001. Why 2001? Because it was the year that they sent missionary, Mongolian missionary to a different country, uh, to uh, a different culture. And I look up uh, per capita GDP of uh, Kenya last year, it was 2,080 US dollars. Mongolian church started sending, started to send their missionaries when their per capita GBT was only a quarter of uh, Kenya. Well, Mongolia is a land locked country. Mongolia is situated between Russia and China. So they, whenever they travel, they have to travel through Russia or China or airplane. Mongolia was a, a socialist nation. It was a socialist nation until 1991 and they had new constitution in 1992 and they established multi-party system. And since then they have political freedom and democracy was there, but still uh, they have some ups and downs in politics and economically they were uh, in danger of default, in danger of uh, bankruptcy a few years ago. So financially is not a good, healthy country. How about church? It's a small church. The Mongolian church is a small church. The first Presbyterian church was founded in 1990. That was the first church. And 2000, there were 132 churches. It was one year prior to sending their own Christian member to a cross-cultural uh, uh, region for work. And three years ago, now the church has grown up to 700 churches. So it's a small church, but it's very healthy and growing church. But remember, it was only 132 churches in 2000. One year before their first missionary. And how about the number of Christians in Mongolia? In 2020, there was, there was 46,000 Christians. How about 2013? 36,000 Christians. How about 2001? A lot smaller than that. Maybe 25, yeah, 25,000. It may be 2001, okay? So Christian members were not that high. It's only 1.4% of Mongolian population is Christian. So it's a very small and minor church. But this church started cross-cultural missions since 2001. A single female missionary was sent to Tuva uh, Republic. That's a, a neighboring country. It's part of a Russian uh, Federal, uh, Federate is outside of uh, Mongolia. 
in 2002, a couple missionaries was sent to Briatia, it's another neighboring country. And from 2006, a number of missionaries were sent to Afghanistan. So as of 2018, the Mongolian church sent 19 couples and 23 single missionaries to 10 countries. So that's more than 40, 40 missionaries more than 40 missionaries to 10 countries. How big is the church? Let me remind you of your memory. Only 700 churches and only 46,000 Christians. Okay, and how about economy? Well, Mongolian economy is not as good as Kenya. So uh, we've kind of uh, skimmed through three church stories of their cross-cultural work, okay? Just like these stories, it is possible for you to participate in cross-cultural missions if you trust God, if you are a group, if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, if BMS in 1792 could send missionaries, if Presbyterian Church of Korea in 1913 could send three missionary families to China, if Mongolian church in 2001 could send missionaries, I think all other churches in the world, not all maybe, but most of most churches in the world could send cross-cultural missionaries. Out of those three stories, I come out with I come up with three conditions if we trust God. Do you really believe God is a missionary God? Do you really believe God may use you, use us? And another aspect of it is, if you are a group, well, BMS was possible because a group of pastors got together and put their resources together. The Presbyterian Church of Korea was able to send missionaries, not because one local church did it, but the nationwide Presbyterian churches got their resources together. Mongolian church could send missionaries to different parts of the world because pastors and churches got together. You and your church alone may not be able to do it. This is the historical lesson. But if you are with other pastors, if your church is with other churches, if your diocese get together, if you do that, you can surely do it. And the third one is, if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, Human minds will say no to missions. If you are sane, if you are sane, you will say no to missions. I mean, cross-cultural mission does not make sense to human mind. Because 
there are so many different needs around us. Unless the Holy Spirit compels us, we will only pay attention to our pressing needs. And our pressing needs will never go away. I mean, the needs, the well, Korean church has its own needs. The English church had its own needs. Mongolian church has its own pressing needs. If we take care of our needs, I mean, we will not have time and resources to pay attention to cross-cultural mission. And without the Holy Spirit, we will only pay attention to our pressing needs. That's why the Holy Spirit is important. If we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we will have the spirit of missions because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of God, the spirit of a missionary God. So when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we are filled with the spirit of a missionary God. When we are filled with a missionary God, when we are filled with the spirit of the missionary God, I mean, we cannot help but send missionaries. So you might want to check whether we trust God, whether we have a group of churches or pastors, whether we are filled with the Holy Spirit. At least this is what those three historical stories tell us. Okay, we are on the last page. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. Who said it? William Carey. William Carey was a shoemaker. William Carey was a school teacher. And he did both of them to support his own family. He was a pastor of a small church, but he expected great things from God. And he wanted, and he encouraged his fellow pastors to attempt great things for God. And that was the beginning of the great century of Christian mission in the 19th century and the 20th century. We live in the global era. The missions are taking, flown, uh, taking places globally. We call today missions from everywhere to everywhere. So these stories are not isolated stories. The, the, the cross-cultural mission had all humble beginnings. They had doubts. They, had, they didn't know what to do. But when they press on with faith, when they step out by faith, God was there. So these are the three stories that we can find from the history. Okay, well, thank you all for listening to my uh, presentation. Uh, Pastor Jeff. Thank you very much. Okay. Um... All right, so do you have any questions uh, written on the 
message box. Let me just check. Um, okay, can you, um, Dr. Hansen, can, can you just uh, end up your screen sharing? Yes. Yeah, thank you. All right, so no questions has been written on the uh, message chat box. So, okay, so if you have any any questions, if you want to make any comment and your thought and your idea, uh, just feel free to raise up your hands um, through. Yeah, or well, you can just uh, write whatever you want on the um, chat box as well, if you're too shy to do it. No one wants to say anything. Do the respond. Okay. So, um, oh, all right. So, okay. Okay. Well. Yeah. Uh, there's questions. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. Answer. Somebody asked a question. How do one maintain faith through all the barriers of missionary work? especially for the younger generation. Well, well, you, we all know that our God is a missionary God and our God is an Emmanuel God, right? When we are facing barriers, God is with us. We may leave God, but God never leaves us. So God is there and just depend on him. Yeah, God is there, just depend on him. Barriers, problems, troubles will come and go away. But God is there all the time. Like rain, heavy rain comes. It's like it will never stop. But that's a lie. Heavy rain comes and heavy rain goes. God is there. Okay, so before we proceed to um, answer the questions um, um, be asking by Reverend Samuel, so um, there's, okay, uh, there's one. Uh, Dr. Joseph um, actually asked, can work international partner with us to do cross-cultural mission? Of course. So we'll be discussing about more in details. Um, you still have, I've got four more weeks, right? So, yeah. And. Okay, so I think um, Reverend Samuel, you raise up your hand even before Sylvia Courier actually put up the questions on the chat box. So, um, Reverend Samuel, can you just show up your face, um, turn on your camera, and you can just ask a question? Thank you. Yeah, unmute your microphone. Yeah, unmute your microphone. Just okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh huh. I was wondering about uh, uh, what uh, a church can do. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was wondering what uh, what a church can do uh, when uh, you want to do cross-cultural missions, but then you are met with the barrier of language and uh, maybe you don't have an, a translator. Um, wouldn't that be a very big hindrance? So or what do you think? Okay, uh, cultural adaptation progress a process is not only for Westerners. Okay, when we okay. become cross-cultural missionaries, 
we need to learn how to decipher, how to understand cultures and how to communicate in foreign languages. Okay, well, you, I mean, uh, Kenyan church has many missionaries to your home. And what, what does it look like when missionaries do not speak your language? It's not great, right? So mm -hmm. likewise, when Kenyan missionaries go to different places and Kenyan missionaries don't speak their language, well, it doesn't look good, right? So we yeah. all, we all need to go through learning process. We will learn, let's say you send missionaries to uh, Ivory Coast, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's say you send uh, a missionary to Ivory Coast. Well, Ivory Coast is on the African continent, but it doesn't mean you share the same culture. It yeah. doesn't mean you speak the same language. You may have similar skin color, but you are from a very different culture and language. So you need to learn Ivory Coast culture and language. Just like Koreans, when Korean missionaries go to Japan, well, we need to learn Japanese culture and we need to learn Japanese language, although Koreans and Japanese look alike to you, right? So yeah. missionaries are missionaries. If there are things that we need to learn, well, we need to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah okay. Here, well, thank you for your question. Here are some other thank questions. You. So I'm going to read, okay? Uh, uh, somebody asked me, if I can share my uh, PPT file, uh, Pastor Jeff Yoon has my, uh, my PowerPoint presentation. And Jeff, you can uh, free to share. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So what I'll do, I'll, I'll just pa pass it on to uh, Reverend Tyros and he'll um, hand it over to you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then. So another question, uh, I'll read it, read it out to you, uh, Hansa. So do we major uh, do we major in areas on that do not know the Lord or all areas or where do we focus most? So Emma Okay uh, question, yeah. in, in 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 mission history we go from near to far generally. Okay? Not all the time, and this is not uh, this is the only biblical way. I'm not saying this is the only biblical way, but in history, I see one after the other, people go from near to far. For example, Mongolian missionaries, they reached out to different people groups in Mongolia, and soon they when they send missionaries to a country that had that is sharing the border with Mongolia. And then they send people to Afghanistan, then Thailand, then uh, North Korea. For Koreans, we send missionaries to diaspora Koreans outside of Korea. And then we send missionaries to China. And then we send missionaries to Taiwan and Thailand and Pakistan and Ethiopia and places like that and, and Vietnam, okay? And, and uh, after, yeah. And so Korean missionaries went to China, went to Africa a little later. So if Kenyan church consider sending missionaries. You might want to send missionaries uh, in Africa first, or what countries are close to you. For us, 
China was very close emotionally and psychologically. And I believe Kenya and people in Kenya has some uh, psychologically close countries. And you might want to send missionaries there. Yeah, so things like that. Yeah. And uh of course, uh, eventually you will send missionaries to uh, countries that you never heard of. That's what Korean missionaries are sent at the end. Okay. Mm -hmm. All yeah. right. Another questions. Um, so asked, uh, no, no, um, Samuel. So are there special training required to carry out this cross-cultural mission? Of course, of course. Can you be a pastor without theological training? Of course not, right? What if somebody comes up to comes up to you and say, "Well, I have read the Bible fifty times. Can I be a pastor?" What did you say? No way, Jose. Right? <laughs> Go to the seminary. Just like that. If you want to be a missionary, and if you want to send the missionary cross culturally, well, you need to help the missionary prepare cultural. Uh, adjustment and language adjustment okay and i think well, WEC international may help with that they have a, a long history of uh, equipping missionaries so that's one way area that you can consider and, and, and Esther. yeah Esther, my question is how do i know that i'm worthy for the missions both on my societal level and intercultural level? Well, what did God tell you? That is the most important thing. What that, what has God tell you, told you? Did he call you for mission work? That is the most important thing. And then what does your church tell you? Not just a local church. What does your diocese tell you? Do they agree or do they think you are good fit for missions? They may not say you are right now, but don't be disappointed. If God has called you to mission, well, you need to improve yourself. You need to prepare for yourself for the work and the church will acknowledge you. Okay. Society, what other people say is not really that important. If God has called you. The thing is, does God really tell you to go? And how long have you prayed until you hear the message? How many times have you read the Bible until you hear it? There is no magic number. There is no uh, uh, magic formula to know God's will. But without the Bible, without prayer, how can we discern God's will? Please be interested in world mission and give yourself to prayer and Bible reading and fully understand, or try to understand that the God that we serve is a missionary God. And encourage your fellow pastors to form a group to support a missionary, just like William Carey did. William Carey never said, I'm a missionary that God appointed, so I'm going. He never did it. He asked pastors to consider this. 
and he encouraged pastors to work together. That is very important. Okay. Yeah, so last one we've got, okay, so very informative session, but on average and from ex experience, how long would it take to fully integrate in cross-cultural missions? I do not understand yeah. the question. So somebody needs to explain. Yeah, so Can who, you please explain your question? Is that the comment or questions? Florence? Yes, here I am. Yeah. My question is, uh, when you're getting into cross-cultural missions and you're in a new culture, new environment, how long would it take for you to learn from the language and um, how those people live in general? Okay. okay, good, good. Thank you. Do you know any missionaries to Kenya? How long did they take? to fully integrate into Kenyan culture. Never. <laughs> maybe 20 years, maybe 30 years, right? Never. <laughs> yes. It is a long process, but I would say you will need at least two, three years intense learning. Then you work and learn, work and learn, right? I mean, Yes. Just look at the missionaries to Kenya. If they stop learning, they are just the same after 10 years, 10 years, or 30 years, right? So missionary, the life of missionary is a very a humiliating experience because you will have to forget about your age when you go to a, a new culture. People will treat you like a baby. People will treat you like a girl or boy, right? It's very humiliating. But at the same time, this is so spiritual journey as well. Every time you, have, you feel humiliated, just remember, Oh, this is the way how Jesus was humiliated, but he went through it, right? So, I mean, the life of missionary is so blessed. Yeah. Okay, so um, so I need to excuse. Um, we have the um. Thank you. The specialist here um he's actually now based in kenya is paul all good to hear is paul no i i, I saw your name yeah so what i'll uh, do yes joe Jeff, i'm uh, i'm here yeah? yeah can you show your face yes sure yeah, so he's actually, he's now based in Kenya. He's, he's one of our fellow workers uh, with REC International. So he's a specialist in cross-culture training. Um, um, it's now just established in Kenya. So he'll be helping out uh, what actually you've been asking uh, questions relating to uh, cross-culture cross training. So Paul, I'll just give you, uh, because of the time limit, I'll just give you one minute to uh, just like one or two minutes to uh, say about yourself or briefly explain about your course and I'll give it more time later, yeah? Uh, good morning, pastors. Good morning to Christo. Buona Yesu Christo asifiwe. Tunaelewa lugha yenu. Mimi ni Mkenya kama nyinyi na nina furaha ya kuwa pamoja nanyi. So I'm I'm happy to be Together with you, my names are Paul Joshua Gutu, and uh, I am a worker, work with Work International. Uh, and part of the mission and the call that God has given us is to be able to come to Kenya and to establish a cross cultural mission training program for Africa. Exactly what Dr. Hansu Kim has been pointing out the importance of training in the paradigm of missions. 
And that's, that's the calling that God has given us. And so far, we've been able to relocate back to Kenya after a turn of being away from the country. And we are working towards that. But as uh, Reverend Joff has said, we, he might, at the end of this uh, webinar, provide that opportunity where we'll be able to share a little bit more. But it's just a joy to, to see what God is doing in our continent of Africa. And if anything can be said, the time is now for Africa to rise up to the Yeah, amen. Amen. Yeah. Right. So one of the questions that was responded there as to the nearness of our involvement in missions. Well, I do not know if you knew, but 14 people groups are still unreached with the gospel in Kenya. And that is already tabled uh, in some of the research engines such as Joshua Project, if you wanted to look further into it, and we can discuss a little bit more. Reverend Juf, thank you very much. We'll look forward to a later, later opportunity. And uh, thank you, Dr. Hanson Kim, for your presentation. It's our pleasure. Okay, so um, we've got the, all right, one person just raise up the hand. So, um, Greeson, Mr. Pastor Greeson or Mr. Greeson, do you want to say something or do you want to ask questions? Can you unmute your microphone, please? You need to unmute your microphone. At the bottom, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, good. Uh, that I wanted to ask and uh, quote the uh, pastor is that you expect great things from God. I agree. Uh, actually, you can't. Is there's constant cut. So um, maybe uh, you've got some problem with your microphone or whatever. Can you just check? I can't hear you, actually. You can write your questions on the on the chat box if, if you can. Do you want to do you want to have a go? Yeah, do you want to go? Yeah. Are you hearing? Yeah, it's, it's still yeah. You can leave your message on the chat box if you want. Sorry. Okay, so we've got, because of time limit, so we'll just one more person, one person to um, give chance make a comment so or your idea or your if you want to ask any questions if i may uh, say something about mongolian church well mongolia is very uh less populated nation mongolia is a big country by land size but it's a small country by its population so it is very, uh, people's are uh, sparse uh, and uh, it's not dense like uh, African countries or Korea. So that's one reason. And the growth rate is really high. I mean, in 10 years, they gain 10,000 people. Yeah. When a church goes to, when, when Christian gospel goes to a, a place, for the first time, the, the initial uh, speed or initial growth is very uh, slow. But comparing to uh, uh, Islamic countries, this is very fast. Comparing to Islamic countries, it is fast. But comparing to uh, 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 African continent, it is not so fast. But it, the church is really growing. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it seems like no one's um, 
leaving message on the chat box and uh, asking questions and making comment. So um, it's nine to it's now time to end up uh, for the entire session today. But before we go, um, just a minute. I just need to uh, share screen. All right. Okay, so I'll I'll just give you a couple of housekeeping announcements. All right, so um, next week, so our um, the webinar will continue next week as well. At the same time, Monday, um, January thirtieth. Um, so the actual session will be starting from nine a.m., but uh, the Zoom will be opening from eight thirty in Kenya time. And next uh, topics for next week. So church planting and church growth. Okay. Okay. And let me just introduce the speaker for next week. So we have um, Dr. Kyungnam Park. He's the current international director of WEC International, and he was the former director of WEC Korea. He was missionary in Afghanistan. He was a medical doctor as well. He's, he's, he'll be speaking on uh, church planting. And another person will be uh, speaking on the church growth. He's the one of the, um, the special um, person uh, that you might be able to get a chance to hear his experience. He's, uh, as you see, he's got quite a like good profile. Um, and he's his former senior minister of Hallelujah Church, one of the biggest mega church in Korea. And he was the president of Touch Trinity, our seminary, and WEA, ATA, and many other stuff. So uh, he'll be uh, speaking on next week as well. And one more thing. So um, this is special thing. Please don't forget, send your full name, yeah? Your surname, your given name, and send to um, Dr. Joseph, your training coordinator, Thika Diocese, yeah? Don't forget it, and send it by, it'll be better to do it actually today. That is uh, just for the attendance checking, right? So um, please send it by today. And um, Hansung Kim, can you just um, end up the entire session uh, by prayer? Maybe before okay. that. Well, thank you again for this opportunity. Yep. And uh, uh, may God uh, bless you. Let's pray. Yep. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful time of meeting uh, each other uh, via Zoom. Uh, you are the creator and you are the redeemer of earth and people father we thank you for the anglican church of kenya and especially the diocese that is involved in this training father please bless the church in kenya and this particular diocese and we pray that the spirit of a missionary god which is you, will touch upon each heart and mind of the pastors who attended this seminar today, that they will not rest. They will be challenged. They will, be un they will, they will feel uneasy until they seek your way to follow uh, your missionary steps. Father, please mobilize your church in Kenya and share the gospel through them. The love, the peace, the happiness that Jesus came to give us. We thank you, Lord. And we thank you for WEC International and IMM who organized this. We thank you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. And um, so glad to, glad to see you all today.